Hey everyone, welcome to Duality Repair. I have another Tektronix 2213A 60 megahertz oscilloscope to repair. This one's got a pretty interesting problem and rather than show you, I'll let you listen to it. So you can hear that rattling around, that's the CRT glass, it imploded. So this is gonna be an interesting one for me. This is my first CRT replacement. And this was sent by a viewer who uh, purchased this knowing that it had a problem. He also purchased a spare CRT and I verified the models are the exact same, so that will work, which is good. Uh, obviously I'm gonna replace the CRT. I'm also going to tune this up as best I can. You know, I looked around the uh, boards a little bit and everything looks to be in really good condition. So I think once we get the CRT replaced, uh, we replace the electrolytics and maybe clean the potentiometers, all the dials are here and everything. I think this thing is gonna run really well. I'll uh, go through any of the adjustment procedures that I can that are highlighted in the service manual and we'll get this thing ready for um, ready for action. So CRT replacement, first things first, I'll remove the anode. So the anode's up here, just unplugs there and I've already done this so ordinarily it'd be a little more safe but I've already done this. You just pull it out, here's the anode tip right there. When this is live it's at uh, looks like seven, eight thousand volts and even when it's been off for a while it can still keep a charge so what you want to do is you want to discharge this to a chassis so you want to make sure that your hands aren't on the chassis and the chassis is not sitting on anything conductive before you discharge it to the chassis and then now you know that the anode in the CRT is safe this thing has been off for several weeks maybe months and uh, it's also broken and I've also uh, already grounded this to the chassis so I know it's safe so that's step one step two is removing the front of the CRT or disconnecting it and that's just these two bottom screws here Torx head T15 maybe T5, uh, T20 and then we have to remove the vertical and horizontal uh, deflection wires so here are the vertical wires right here you just remove them and then the uh, horizontal are down here I'm definitely going to want to label these so that I know which way uh, where they go when I put them back maybe T for top and B for bottom or something like that same with uh, the bottom, the horizontal deflection wire, so make sure to do that. The only thing I'm unsure of, and I haven't consulted the service manual with that, is, uh, is how to get the back out. I, I think uh, once I remove the front two screws and I get these disconnected and I get the anode disconnected, it might just slide out to the right. Uh, if I have a little trouble, I'll consult the service manual since it does have the uh, CRT removal procedure in there, but I'm going to get working on that. All right, I got the CRT out. It wasn't too much of a hassle. There were a few things that I missed when I explained earlier. Number one, uh, these set of pins here, you can see the two pins coming out of this board. This is for the trace rotation, so you do have to disconnect that trace rotation connector uh, before you can remove the CRT. And then two other things. Uh, I mentioned that the front face plate is connected with the two screws on the bottom and the front. I missed the two screws uh, on the top and the back. So there's a screw here and there's another screw in this corner here. Those also have to be removed. Once you get all of that removed, and the other things I mentioned, it does just slide out to the right, which is perfect. And so after I cleaned up all of the glass, um, I'm ready to go. Now, since it's, well, never the case, we get to look at a CRT, or that I get to anyway, I thought we'd take a look at this. <laughs> Pretty awesome. So obviously it's still got a few glass fragments on there. Those are just still adhered to some of the pins. I'm not going to worry about trying to remove them. Obviously, normally this entire enclosure is encased in, encased in glass all the way to the front uh, screen here. It's also obviously broken. It sits like this. It's encased in glass and under vacuum. But let's take a look around um, since we really never get to analyze something like this. Um, so the back is the connector. You can see all the pins there. One good thing that I noticed, I was worried about how I was going to reconnect the new one. You do not want to connect uh, this incorrectly so if you can see there's a key right there this little slot it's keyed so that you can only insert this into the mating connection one way so you can't really install it incorrectly which is great foolproof and so a little bit on the CRT functionality if we start on the left this little cylinder there that's going to be the cathode where the electrodes are generated all of this here is going to be uh, various uh, focusing, so beam focusing and beam acceleration to focus and accelerate the electron beam. 
down the electron gun. When we get here, you can see this gold metal right here, and there's another one on the opposite end. That's one of the deflection plates, so I think that's the vertical deflection plate, although I'm not sure. And then we have uh, another set of plates right here. You can see these a lot easier. These are the opposite set of plates, so either the vertical or horizontal. And so these are, uh, the voltage difference between the two plates is going to determine the amount of deflection of the electron beam before it hits the screen. And that's it for the electron gun portion. Let's take a look at the screen portion. There's not too much to look at. So you can see we've got this coil here, and that's connected to this trace rotation connector that I mentioned. And then, of course, we have the anode that we removed and the screen itself. Now, if we look at the screen, I thought this was kind of interesting. You can see all these little defects. Those are on the inside. So what happened was when this thing imploded, a bunch of the shards of glass scraped off some of the phosphor, the internal phosphor coating on the screen. And so even if the screen was usable, which obviously it never will be, again, uh, you'd have all these um, really ugly defects that would make it unappealing to, uh, to visualize. So. so that's the CRT. I'm going to get this out of here. I'm going to clean up the rest of the glass fragments that I have. And uh, I'm going to pull the new CRT, clean it up a little bit, and get it installed. All right, the CRT went in without an issue, and the traces show up, as you can see, which is great. But there's still a lot of issues to deal with, so let me show you a few of them. So channel 1, when I insert the probe into the calibration port, I get nothing. Channel 2, I do get a signal, which is great. You get the nice square wave there. So problem number one is channel one's input is not working. Problem number two is this channel selection switch here is really light. Uh, what I mean by that is there's no resistance. When I use these other two switches of the same type, there's a lot of resistance and there's really uh, discrete and definite steps when you change uh, positions. And this one's just kind of almost free floating. So there's some sort of mechanical issue going on there that I'll have to address. And I looked around the board a little bit more closely, and I discovered that somebody has definitely done some work on the power supply section. So we'll go to the power supply section. I'll show you what I found there and the work that will need to be done. OK, obviously, we're looking at the back of the board. But this section here outlined by the square is the power supply section. And you can see there's a lot of redone solder joints on here. So you can see there's this two rows of four up here. Um, these are four resistors that were for some reason replaced. They're definitely not original. All of these solder joints need to be redone. Uh, we have a bank of four here that were redone. We have this one here. The one that's really concerning is this jumper added right here. No idea what that's for. That's going to have to be looked at. Uh, we have a whole bunch of other joints right here that have been touched up. We have some over here that have been done. And it looks like even that main filter capacitor, the 75 microfarad, at 450 volts was uh, redone a little bit and added some solder to it or whatever. It's definitely still the original, um, but they added some solder to that for some reason. Um, somebody touched up a whole bunch of joints down here as well. So a lot of uh, area for concern in just the power supply section alone. So all of these joints are going to have to be probably completely redone. Let me show you the top of the board with all of the components. Not as many problems to see from the top. If we look at the top, so right here, see these four bigger resistors? These are the ones that were replaced. Those are the ones that are not original. Uh, the, there's three electrolytics that were also replaced. There's one right here, one right here, and one over here. Not sure why they only replaced three and why those three. Otherwise, the rest look to be original. There's some um, additional solder on this jumper right here. This is the 100 volt. Uh, test point and it's just a jumper but for some reason there's a whole bunch of extra solder on there and you're not going to be able to see it but so there's a uh, something mounted right here so you can see this package right here there's a tra uh, transistor in there sorry for the focusing the transistor that drives the transformer here is mounted here and then there's this block down here and under there I believe there's another transistor or two and I can see a lifted trace. Ah, sorry about the focus again. You're not going to be able to see it. There's a lifted trace under here, and that is likely what that jumper was for. There's a whole bunch of issues to address just in the power supply section. That's going to fix some issues. It's going to make this thing more reliable, but it's not going to fix, it's definitely not going to fix the two issues that I spoke about earlier. 
Uh, channel 1's input signal failure is going to probably come from this board here. It's got the attenuations for channel 1 and channel 2. Uh, it's got the uh, sweep selection switch right here and uh, all of the necessary circuitry to deal with those signals. Um, and then that switch that I mentioned too with the likely mechanical failure is also uh, is on this front board here. I've dealt with this type of board once or twice in the past. Uh, it's a pain. It's going to be a pain to get this off, to get this front board off, but it's going to need to be done. So my first step is going to be to remove and replace all of these electrolytics, even the three that have been replaced. I should be able to find a, a, a fair replacement for this one. It's not going to be an exact match, but it'll be something very, very close. It'll be a lot smaller than this older version. Should mount to the board okay. And then I'm going to, uh, as I said, redo all of those weak solder joints on the back. And I'll keep you updated. In front of the scope, I have all of the replacement capacitors lined up for the A1 board. The A1 board is the main board on the bottom of the unit. On the right, you can see I already removed the bulk smoothing capacitor. And the reason I did this was to take a look at the lead layout as I'm unfamiliar with this type of capacitor. So this is just an old style. And um, this bottom pin here, which is the smaller pin or the smaller lead, is the positive, And the other three on the outside are ground. And so you can find replacements for this online, say on eBay, but I didn't want to buy a used one, so I bought this new one. It's a standard uh, two lead, which would work just fine. I will uh, fill in the unpopulated, two unpopulated ground through holes with solder. It should work. This one is slightly higher in capacitance at 82 microfarads versus 75. It's got the same voltage rating at 450. And obviously with a much smaller size, that's um, a benefit as well. So I have a lot of work to do. I'm going to get started on this capacitor replacement. All of the electrolytics have been replaced on the main board. The scope turns on just fine, and we still get nice, clean sweeps across the screen for both channel 1 and channel 2. However, we have a new problem. Before the work, at least channel 2's vertical deflection was present. I could see the calibration signal with channel 2, but now I can't. So both channel 1 and channel 2 no longer have the vertical deflection. Their signals are not getting through to the CRT. So before I start looking at the schematics, to try and identify where this problem might be. I thought I'd look at the power supply voltages first as I replace all of the electrolytics in the power supply section. So we'll start with that. I don't expect there to be any problems since the rest of the scope is functioning, but it's worth a check. The nice thing about this unit is that the power supply voltages are all printed nicely on the board and their test points are very easily accessible. So let's start at the top. I'll read them out. This should be positive 30. Positive 29.8, that's okay. Below that, 100, positive 100. Good. Uh, way down here, positive 8.6. That's good. Below that, positive 5. Good. And below that, negative 8.6. And that's good. So right, all of the power supply voltages are present. They're all very, very close to what they should be. So I don't think the problem is there. Likely the problem is going to be something to do with this attenuator board here but I'll take a look at the schematics and try and identify where we want to start probing. Alright, finally troubleshooting time. So the first thing I want to look at is channel 1. I want to look at this first since this was a problem before I even started working on this unit. And so I've done quite a bit of work already to identify what the problem is. You can see the setup I have here. So I have my BNK1477 scope hooked up. That's what I'm going to probe with, channel 1 or channel A. I have the Tektronix channel 1 hooked up to my B and K calibration signal. So when I hit the signal with the probe, I should get a nice square wave. Um, I was able to identify that the attenuator board was the problem with channel A. I checked the output of that board and I got no signal. So I know the problem is somewhere on the board. If we look at the schematic, the signal enters on the left through the B and C. It travels through a whole bunch of different components before exiting the right through that connector that I mentioned. And so there's a few ways to do this. You can probe from left to right until you stop seeing the signal. You can probe from right to left until you start seeing the signal. Or you can start in the middle. And then if you see the signal, you move to the right. If you don't see the signal, you can move to the left. I'm just going to probe from left to right. So I want to look for some identifiable and um, easily accessible components. R2 is pretty much where the signal enters the board. So let's look at R2 here. And we have the signal there. Let's look at R3 next. 
we have the signal there as well. Let's check the base of Q13. And it's there. Let's check the base of Q18. It's there as well. Now we have this resistor pack here. It's going to enter at pin 6 here. And it's going to exit pin 5 here. All right, so a signal is making it almost to the end of the line. We're at this custom Tektronix IC here. It's the U30. And it's going to enter pin 4. So let's measure pin 4. And we have it there. And it should exit through a differential signal out of pins 10 and 13. So let's look at pin 10. And you can see we have nothing there. And 13, we have nothing there as well. So it's likely that that custom Tektronix I see is the problem, which is unfortunate because it's, uh, of course, decades old. And they haven't made any new ones for decades. You can find a few here and there online, but they're fairly expensive for what they are. Um, that might be what we have to do. The only other thing you want to do to rule out anything else other than the IC is to check the incoming voltage to that. So if we look at the schematic, again, pin 6 has minus 8.6 volts coming across R34. And I measure there, and that's accurate. And pin 14 should have positive 8.6 volts coming across the three resistors there, uh, two resistors, excuse me, and you should have something like 2.5 volts uh, at that pin, and that was accurate as well. So it's very, very likely that ICU30 is the problem with channel 1. Now, I'm not going to order and replace that yet. I want to identify what the problem is with channel 2. If the problem is also on the attenuator board, and the part is either expensive or difficult to obtain, it may be easier and cheaper just to replace the entire attenuator board. So let's get started with channel 2's troubleshooting. I was unable to replicate the problem I was seeing earlier with channel 2, so I'm going to ignore that for the moment. I was able to find a replacement for U30. This is the old one. I was able to remove it after quite a bit of effort. And the new one came in this genuine Tektronix box, and uh, it was advertised as brand new. So we'll see if that works. Before I test it, I want to clean this front faceplate here. You can see all of the exposed areas are much dirtier than the unexposed where it was covered by the knob. So I'm going to clean all this up really well. I'm also going to clean up all of the previously reworked solder on the back of the board, mostly in that power supply area, and then we'll be ready to test. All right, I cleaned the front face plate up pretty well. It's about as close to original as I'm going to get it. I also cleaned up the back of the board with all of the uh, reworked solder joints. And I put the cover back on and cleaned that up as well, so we're ready to test it out. And so I have a 1 megahertz 4 volt peak to peak sine wave at both inputs, and as you can see, they both look great. So I've already checked uh, most of the frequency range on this scope, at least as high as my signal generator will go, that's 15 megahertz, and everything looks good. I also went through a good section of the voltage range as well. My signal generator goes up to, I believe, 20 volts peak to peak, and it looks good there as well. The last thing that I mentioned previously of uh, potentially wanting to repair or replace was this channel selection switch. I mentioned that it was loose. There was no tension or uh, no resistance. But I've tested it, and as you can see, if I switch from channel 1 to both to channel 2, back to both, there's absolutely no issue electrically with this switch. So. Um, I've already investigated it a little bit. This is uh, attached to this front PCB here, and it's very, very difficult to access that. Really, you have to remove the front PCB. It's mounted to this bottom PCB, and there's about, I don't know, 30 or 40 solder joints to remove, and those are very difficult joints to remove. So I don't think it's worth uh, trying to remove that board to investigate it any further. Since we've already checked the voltages and everything is looking really, really great, I'm going to call this one repaired, and I will see you on the next video. Thanks for watching.